lot of clout when you pick a bunch of upsets in the NCAA tournament. And then after the first weekend, when your bracket's in uh, shambles, you know, what are you left with? You're left with a bracket that doesn't look very good. And everybody's like, uh, nice job picking all those upsets when they don't happen. Welcome in on this Monday. Snowing outside. Very busy weekend. A lot of, uh, they say, housekeeping things going on with uh, Michigan in football and in basketball. And as you are probably aware, there's other sports going on as well. And we're going to get to a lot of it here on the Maize and Blue Review. Michigan has uh, suspended their defensive line coach. I'll give you some thoughts on that situation. Also, the conference tournaments are over. Selection Sunday yesterday. Michigan is in need of a a new basketball coach. I'll give you uh, an updated list that I made just in this last hour of, uh, I think, the, the best coaches and likely coaches that Michigan will be targeting. But we will start with spring practice. We're talking about practice, not the games. That's a ways away, but we are talking about practice. Oh, before that, I do want to give a shout out and a congratulations to the Michigan hockey team. I know Mark, who is a a loyal follower of this show and contributor, will I'll uh, I'll pour my heart out, put all my research in, do this show, and then about ten minutes left in the show, Mark will jump in and say, "Why don't you talk about hockey?" And uh, I get that people that people that like hockey, you know, like hockey as much as anything that's out there. And one thing that I've always found about Michigan hockey is that you can parachute in at any time on Michigan hockey, whatever in the season. Maybe you're there from, you know, the blue and white game right away when they're uh, playing uh, early on and then all the way to the end, you know, the frozen four or whatever. But, um, you know, the week before the games were on Big Ten Plus against Notre Dame in the quarterfinals, I didn't see any of those games, but Saturday's game against Minnesota was on the Big Ten Network, and I took it all in. And I would say this about Michigan's game against Minnesota. That was one of the most solid performances that I have ever seen from Michigan, or really any team, from start to finish. Michigan was disciplined with their defense. They had outstanding goaltending. I think about the uh, – there were only uh, two power plays. Each team had one. But the Minnesota power play, Barcheski, the goaltender, he's left-handed, re- reached out with a fabulous glove save, and he only went let one by him, and that was when the Gophers had uh, pulled their goaltender for an extra attacker. So uh, number one star would be – Barcheski, but man, the uh, Draper scoring early, Brindley with the speed up the right side, making no mistake. Michigan had a, a goal disallowed, and it was a dandy that was in the first period. Really, uh, I would give Michigan a, a 10 out of 10 in, and, and maybe you want to say 9 5 because they did allow a goal, but man, they were solid. And if they play like that, they can win it all. Now, They haven't shown the consistency over the year for those that have watched, like through the weekends, they've come out, uh, play well Friday, not so much Saturday or vice versa. Maybe they're peaking at the right time, but again, they play like they did on Saturday, this next Saturday against Michigan State, and they will beat the Spartans for the uh, Big Ten uh, tournament, and uh, Michigan Michigan is Michigan hockey is a tournament team. You get them in the get them in the conference tournament, they're good. Get them in the NCAA tournament, they're ready to advance. And it, this is the time of year. You you want to look back? People, it was kind of a whole hum regular season for Michigan, but now here they are in the Big Ten championship game and, and you know, looking you know, forward to the championship game, obviously, and then also obviously looking forward to the the tournament as well, which they're going to be part of. So great time of year. If you're a college hockey fan now practice Friday, I was uh, lucky enough to put my feet on the, the Michigan football turf in the end zone where they had assembled a podium and a lectern and a backdrop 
and they brought Michigan's two new coordinators in to meet the media. And we were able to get the thoughts of Kirk Campbell, Michigan's new offensive coordinator, and then Michigan's new defensive coordinator, Wink Martindale. As I think about practice, I would say that the quarterback would easily be the number one storyline, if I'm a Michigan fan, about what's going to take place under center for the Wolverines with the departure of J.J. McCarthy. Now, I reported, uh, I guess I was reporting, I was just talking about uh, how Campbell said he was going to line them up today to take the snaps. And uh, I said he was going to do it alphabetically. I guess I, I did miss it. I went back and listened. He said he was going to do it by class and then alphabetical. So Jack Tuttle, the seventh year transfer from Indiana, he will go first for Michigan as the, as the senior. And then they'll go to the junior quarterbacks, Denigal and Orgy. Denigal before Orgy because it's alphabetical like that. And then, uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Davis Warren will be be before the juniors because he's a senior now. And then you'll mix in uh, Jaden Davis. So I I don't know how they mix in because there are other walk-on quarterbacks that will be in the mix there and how they're put in there. Maybe the first day it's by class and it's by uh, being alphabetical. But then we'll see. But that's not a big deal. But I I did say it uh, erroneously on uh, Friday when I was just talking off the top of my head after what uh, Campbell had to say. So, so quarterback uh, Campbell also mentioned that uh, miles Hinton was at left tackle and we'd been uh, myself, probably others as well. When they were speculating about the Michigan offensive line had Hinton over at right tackle, but it Hinton at left tackle prebe pre- at left guard, Crippen at center, El Hadi at right guard, and I would guess either Gentry or Jones right now. That's what it looks like will be, and I would guess Gentry over Jones if I had to pick today. I mean, they're just starting practice today, so uh, things can change there. But I would guess that that would be the offensive line uh, that we would see in a little bit over a month that will be starting for uh, Michigan when they're out there in the maize and blue game and then kicker, you know, James Turner moving on and uh, kicker will be another thing to monitor, but whoever it is until they, let's say make a big kick against Texas on September the 7th, that one's going to have a big question mark next to it. And then also defensive depth overall, Michigan, as we all know, they've got a pretty good defense. We can sit here and talk about it and we will over the next few months about just how good this defense looks on paper. But like a baseball team up the middle, when you're talking about Mason Graham and Kenneth Grant, nobody in the country has two better uh, defensive tackles than uh, Graham and Grant. And then you just keep going back. Jay Sean Barham and then um, Ernest Hausman as linebackers, and then you keep going back in the middle, Rod Moore and Makari Page, put uh, Cujo, Quinton Johnson in there as well. I'll put Jaden Hood in the mix at linebacker, and hopefully Rayshon Benny, who you remember was hurt. Was he hurt in the Rose Bowl, or was he hurt in the Big Ten Championship game? Hmm. I don't remember. One of those two. Or maybe it was the Ohio State game. Now now I'm – if I had to guess, I would say the Rose Bowl. Hopefully Benny is back from uh, from his injury. So that's how they're looking up the middle, and it does look pretty good. This announcement, uh, after I go through the three things that I'm going to talk about, then I'm going to go to the feedback and start answering it then. That's how it's uh, going to work here in the – at least on – today's show. So that's how I see spring and the things that are going to be uh, talked about and the things that are are interesting to me. Again, quarterback, the offensive line, kicker, defensive depth, uh, cornerback two. Uh, Cornerback two was uh, was put on there last year. Nobody's going to say, Will Johnson, we we could pencil him in at cornerback one. 
And Josh Wallace, who they got from the transfer portal, ended up doing a, a heck of a job. He got better as the year went on. He played his best football in the postseason, which is uh, great. <laughs> that was wonderful by uh, Wallace. But so the cornerback, too, whoever that will be, will need to shake out in the spring practices as well. So you probably heard the news about Michigan's defensive line coach being suspended indefinitely. And that is Greg Scruggs. I don't know if it's interesting or not. The Maize and Blue Review, where I work, has a posting board, and it's called The Den. I always urge you to join up to talk about Michigan all day and all night. If I had to just guess the the people, the, the Michigan fans that were weighing in on Scruggs and this um, driving while intoxicated, that I would say that he got – the majority of support of hoping that Sharon Moore will bring him back. I would say that it was uh, at least 80% of the people that were like, you know, ultimately wanting to bring Scruggs back. Now, when you talk about alcohol related inc- incidents, everyone, there's a lot of things that people, don't really know. They, we try to have an opinion, but with uh, drinking and driving, people all have very strong opinions on it. So if you have an opinion one way or the other, uh, I respect that, and I'm going to give you mine. I think that when it comes down to Sharon Moore, because this is not a first-time related issue, I would support Greg Scruggs, try to give him any kind of help, not knowing the severity of his situation or whatever was going on, just the facts. And that's what they're finding out here, uh, which I'll get to in a moment as well. But uh, give him the support, whether it's you know finding him uh, a place where he can get treatment or having that support, having him still around the football program. I think um, you know that's a good idea. But but coaching, when you are in the, the spotlight at a place like Michigan, is a privilege. And this is a repeated pattern that we have from Scruggs. So uh, that's what I think Sharon Moore will do. I think he will move on from, from Scruggs. Myself, if I put myself in the position of new head coach, First day of spring practice, Greg Scruggs over the weekend gets a driving while intoxicated under the influence. Uh, I would also move on myself. That's my my opinion. I would move on because it's a repeated pattern, uh, more than one. And, and I think that's what Sharon Moore will do as well. I understand fully that not everybody's going to agree with me, and I think that's okay. I think where there might be a, a little bit where it might not necessarily be just all black and white. And for some, it is. If he's over 0. 0.08 and he's, he's had other instances, you know, that could be automatic to some. Again, I, I get that. Uh, could there be a situation where Sharon Moore comes out and vouches for Scruggs' character and says that during the vetting process that they knew about these two situations, alcohol situations in his past, and what went into those and how he has lived his life since. And could I see if the report came back with a 0. 0.08, which is the right at the, 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 uh, the, the limit where if you're under, everybody knows if you're 0. 0.07 and under, you're okay. But 0. 0.08 is where you get in trouble. If, 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 you you have Sharon Moore who knows feels like he has a good grasp on his character and his drinking history, and Moore comes out and and vouches for his uh, his character and how he has dealt with uh, this these situations in the past, and it, it's a point zero eight, and he comes out and says, "Look, there was a there was a heavy pour over at nights or you know, the on." Uh, a heavy pour on a just had two glasses of wine. I don't know. Two glasses of wine might be able to put you there. 
And that's usually my limit of, of two glasses uh, of, uh, you know, I, I say that. And I can remember a couple of years ago going to a, a Mexican restaurant, Maze. And uh, I was the, the designated driver. But, you know, so two drinks. But they brought out my drink and it was like, you know, I don't know, 50 ouncer. And I was like, woo, two drinks. My wife was like, no, you're not, you know. But so I don't know. Like, that's not, it, it, that could be making excuses for somebody. I do think anything over 1.0, that the chances that, Sharon Moore is going to be able to come out and do any kind of uh, vouching for his character or standing by his coach in this situa situation uh, goes down as the alcohol blood content goes up. Like if it somehow it was 1.2 and you're over there saying, yeah, he just had a heavy pour. Uh, I don't know. No, I don't think so. 1.3. I don't know. So. I think the there's a lot of people that are, are looking at other people's situations and comparing them. If we're just talking about sports, I, track record, multiple time offender, and I think more is going to move on. Now that's my opinion and what I would do. So that's where I'm at. To just uh, look back again, Scruggs arrest, uh, arrested on an operating while intoxicated. We don't know the, the details. That's all we know. Sharon Moore uh, did put out a statement, but if you just look in the past, which is public record in 2013, so it's been a few years, Scruggs was arrested in Washington. And according to the court records, it was on suspension, uh, I'm sorry, suspicion of a DUI. And that was pleaded down to reckless driving. I don't know how. DUIs work. I thought if you got a DUI, it was pretty black and white. You're driving under the influence. There's no pleading there. So it, maybe it's different in Washington. You get a 0 .08. And so you don't have, because he was uh, uh, two years earlier, thrown off of his college team because he was arrested on a DUI charge and dismissed from his team. Were they give it, was he getting a break? Because um, if he had two, you know, that could, you know, cost him his uh, his job. He was playing football at that point for the Seahawks. I don't know about the particulars in there, how you can plead it down. And, look, this isn't a, a court of law where Sharon Moore is in, in saying, well, you know, those were so long ago. Those are actually off of his record. I would think with the vetting process that, Michigan now is going through with the, the coaching change. It was one thing that they, that Harbaugh got tripped up on a few times when it came down to certainly uh, you think about the hiring of, of Shemi Schembechler, if they would have gone through what you would say is a routine background check and he wouldn't have been hired. And so they tripped up there. So they were going to really go through the, the records with a fine tooth comb. This would have come up. You would have found this. And if I'm guessing Sharon Moore had that kind of conversation, I would think that if zero tolerance policy already would have been put in with Scruggs, I don't know how hiring and HR works with, uh, with sports and football coaches. I, if you have passed a certain time, did they feel like this didn't even need to be addressed? I would think that it would be. And I would think that there would have been, if that language could be put in a contract, it would be. This is a very high visibility position at the University of Michigan, being the defensive line coach. So and that's where I sit on it. If you're thinking that, um, you know, crazy, uh, again, I understand that. And for you that think that, uh, the majority of people, and I'd say they are Michigan fans that are on the Maze and Blue Review, they would agree with you that they think that this is something that Sharon Moore can um, can stay with Scruggs and he could still stay in his spot. I don't. So we'll just have to see how that plays out. Now, the best thing to do is let it play out. Let's see what that number is that comes back. If, you know, for people that are saying, yeah, like, that was a long time ago. He's kept his nose clean and he had a .08. Let's keep him on the team. Okay. 
but let's wait and see what the number is. So it's a, it, it is speculation about things that, but people are going to speculate on it. You're going to speculate and I'm going to speculate and everybody else is. And so that's where it's at when it comes down to Scruggs, at least where I'm at with it. Friday, Juwan Howard was uh, let go as head coach, Michigan basketball, right as we came on the air at two o'clock. We come on at two o'clock uh, live on Mondays, today, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Juwan Howard issued a statement over the weekend, and it was on Michigan's basketball Twitter. I applaud Juwan Howard. This is this is the right way when you are removed from a, a post like this, that you're like there's a lot of things that you could do that you might want to say and, and all of that kind of stuff. And you could be bitter and all of that. Juwan Howard thanked the university for the privilege of coaching at Michigan. That's the way to do it. He thanked the university, the board of regents, the athletic director for the privilege of coaching at Michigan. His university, he called it. My university for the past five years. That's a classy way to go out. Great job. And I wish Juwan Howard nothing but the best in his future. Great job there with that statement. Now, we get to the coaches. About a month ago, today's the 18th. I put up a tweet of mine from February the 21st. I asked a question on Twitter, how many Michigan fans would be in favor of a John Beeline return for two years with the idea that John turns things over to his son, Patrick, after that? Got a lot of response about that particular tweet. Most of the responses like the idea of John Beeline returning for two years. Most of the responses did not include turning things over to his son, Patrick, after that. Now. Patrick, I believe I have this right, was at Niagara and was coaching, and he was dismissed for the pro from the program, but we never did exactly find out what that was about. And so we could, I could sit here and say, oh, it was this or that, but I'm not going to do that. He was dismissed, and we didn't find out. So I, I don't think it was, uh, in, um, you know, jaywalking. It was, it was bad enough that – they didn't want to say what it was, and neither side said what it was, and he was just dismissed. So that's a big deal. He would have to come uh, clean. He would that would have to be something. What was that? You no, know, it was it's you know again you get into the if it was this could he survive that if it was that right you know I, that we would have to know what it is now. My opinion of having John Beeline, what if it wasn't his son, but if he wanted to come back from two year, for two years, and then, but he would then name his successor. And again, could his successor be Patrick if you felt comfortable with why he was dismissed from Niagara? That's going to be up to you. I would have to know what it is. Again, like, so I, maybe. Maybe I would be comfortable with that if I knew what it was. And could there be another assistant that he could then tab after two years? Remember John Beeline's in his 70s now. That's a tricky proposition. Beeline's very good at identifying. He, he, he would be, if John Beeline was 60, well, he would be so perfect to come back. And you'd think, man, there's nobody. I could identify talent out there better than, than John Beeline. I mean, we're not talking about the five stars, whatever else. John Beeline's sheet, if he worked at Rivals, would look a lot different than everybody else's. And that's what made him part of what made him, but really a big part of what made him a great coach. Now, he left, most people think, because he was disgruntled with the way college basketball was going with the transfer portal and with NIL or payments you know, to players prior. And so why would he come back now that it's the wild West? He lives in Ann Arbor. He still loves the game. He loves coaching the game and it's been long enough and you know, Michigan needs him. So, but, but two years that 
I'm going to put that in the real doubtful category. I don't think it's impossible, but I think it's doubtful. Now, the names, and this has been a fluid list. I've been talking about names for Michigan basketball for a long time, and I am putting a bunch of names up on the screen, and I'm going to go through a few of these. Now, guys like uh, Shaka Smart, who lost uh, yesterday to UConn in the Big East Tournament Championship game, he could be in the mix. He's got a gigantic buyout. Some of these guys, like Nate Oates, who just signed a new deal this week, and um, McDermott from Creighton, Lamont Paris, these guys all just in the last week or two signed new deals. So while it's not impossible for Michigan to come over the top and write some gigantic check, I don't think they're going to do that. I think the biggest name, or I don't know if it's the biggest name, but the 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 name that most people, I think, want is the head coach at Iowa State, Otzenberger, T.J. Otzenberger. And he has done a fabulous job at Ames. Iowa State is going to be a, a lot of people's pick. I think they're in the same bracket as UConn, which hurts them, but or people would be taking them to the Final Four. They beat Houston twice. They wiped them out over the weekend in the Big 12 a tournament. He's done a fabulous job there. Is he best friends with the athletic director who brought him in? I believe that's true. I don't know. Best friends? That's a weird thing to to try to say. Like, uh, he's friends or what is he? He's got a nice relationship with him. He's friends with. That's why he's there to begin with. And I have seen, I was looking at his contract where you had to match the buyout dollar for dollar. And I've seen people put up 16 and a half to 17 and a half million dollars as a buyout. Now, Josh Henschke from the Mason Blue Review said that money is not going to be uh, an issue when it comes down to attracting the next head coach. Now, that would be the biggest buyout, as far as I know, in college basketball history. Nate Oates, who was at 10 or $12 million, was up there as the highest buyout in college basketball history. There could be a little sticker shock from all of us. I go to the grocery store and uh, I start seeing the carton of eggs is five dollars and a, a bag of chips is four seventy five. I'm like, what, what am I doing? Well, I haven't been shopping for five years. My wife goes and does all the shopping, and then I get out there and I'm like, everything, you know, this is this is incredible. Go to McDonald's and you know they're, they're telling me you know eighteen ninety five. And what are you talking about eighteen ninety five? The sticker shock for the coach is if if money isn't going to be something that's holding up and you want to go after the best guy, it's going to cost you some money. So maybe if you're throwing out Shaka Smart and Otzenberger and, you know, let's go. Maybe it's true. Maybe it could happen. But here's who I think this is a combination and, and it's changing all of the time. As I was watching the tournament and working, I was talking with people about all of these things. These are the, I think I have seven or eight names that I have now put up on this list that is in front of you. And for those of you that are listening to the podcast, at the very top of this list is Dusty May from FAU, a team that went all the way to the final four, all the way to the championship game last year. And now they're, Back in the NCAA tournament in May, who learned from Robert Knight at Indiana as a uh, manager, is uh, one of the hottest names in all of college basketball. I am putting him, the Michigan clearly is going to be interested in him. It's I, I think it's a Michigan-Ohio State-Louisville battle, but it appears that Ohio State has they're going to keep their Interim head coach. So this could just come down to a battle between Michigan and Louisville. South Florida did not make the tournament. There were a few bid stealers out there. This was a, a year where if you were a bracketologist, you didn't do well because come the postseason tournaments, there are a lot of bid thieves that jumped up and snatched spots from uh, Pittsburgh, South Florida was one of those, but Amir Abdur Rahim, Amir Abdur Rahim from South Florida, I think we'll get a look from Ward Manuel. Nico Medvedet 
is at Colorado State. He is from, he played at Minnesota. He's got that Big Ten tie there. He's doing a hell of a job out in Colorado Springs. He loves the area there, so it's always been the part where would he leave, uh, would you leave Colorado State for Ann Arbor? I say yes. So uh, Medvedet is on that list. Uh, Anthony Grant is one that was uh, was pushed to me over the weekend, and he is a coach at Dayton. Uh, I was going to say all he does is wins. I, I haven't really dove into that. He's got a good record at Dayton. Uh, he is somebody to keep an eye on. Anthony Grant at Dayton. Dayton, the Flyers, are in the NCAA tournament. I know how this works. You, you get through. Let's say it's Dusty May. Well, you know, they've got an 8-9 matchup. Who are they playing? Northwestern. They lose that first game. We could find out pretty quick on Dusty May. Uh, Abdur Rahim is already out of the NCAA tournament, so we could find out, you know, sooner than later. I don't know about uh, Colorado State. I don't think that they're in the tournament. Once you're not in the tournament, you're like, oh, do you really want to coach that? Couldn't get in the NCAA tournament. That's where uh, people are like, Cronin from UCLA. Oh, they didn't make the tournament this year. People are like, mm, bringing him in. Uh, Chris Collins at Northwestern. Collins is actually playing his team. Northwestern is playing FAU in the first round. The winner gets UConn. Uh, maybe Collins. Collins has a similar situation where it comes down to admissions and academics uh, in, in transfer situations from Michigan. And Collins has done a nice job there. Get a heavy pay raise and uh, come into Ann Arbor. Might be able to do more. Uh, Collins, don't sleep on the uh, former Duke Blue Devil. There are two coaches from the Missouri Valley. And I think both of these guys are going to get bumped up and, and they're going somewhere. Uh, are they going to Michigan is the question. Darian DeVries from Drake. He is a, a favorite of the Maize and Blue Review posting board, by the way, the, the, the Dan. And he's got a nice, he, he won the Missouri Valley this year. He's got a great uh, resume. There's nothing really not to like about him, except that his son, who's got one more year, and I believe was the player of the year in the Missouri Valley, might not be able to get into Michigan because of the transfer. I don't know, that's That could be a little bit of a, a snag. Drake played Indiana State in that championship game. A lot of people wanted to see Indiana State, myself included, in the big dance. They didn't make it, but their head coach, Josh Schertz, also has a nice resume when you look at it. Last year, Jerome Tang put together a, what, 90% of his team was transfers. Uh, he's just been there in Manhattan for a little bit, but he's a rising star. Kansas State didn't make the NCAA tournament, but they had a good year. I had 1920 wins. They just um, were like Louisville, uh, not Louisville, uh, where's Patino at? St. John's. There were a lot of teams that thought they were going to be included in this tournament, but a bunch of bid thieves snatched their chance, and they are now headed to the NIT, except Patino said he didn't do NIT, so he uh, he big-timed the NIT. Some other teams might have done that as well. But those are the names that I have, and there's where it's at. Now, fire away. I'm going to go and take some of your feedback and see where the, the people are at when it comes down to it. Richard Wang in on Scruggs. He says, DUI, automatic bad influence for recruits and players. Yeah. Multi-time. DUI offenders is where the situation, because if we were just saying, I think it's right. DUI, bad influence uh, for recruits and all that. What you're saying is true, but the way things have gone, if you're going to have a policy where, hey, a DUI and you're out, Jim Harbaugh would have never coached at Michigan. He had one when he was at, I believe, San Diego. So he had one on his record. And we could probably sit here and come up with another half dozen or dozen. 
of coaches that, you know, had one and then seemingly have been able to steer clear or just stay away from uh, drinking and driving. But when you get to a, a multiple time offender, I do think that that plays into it a little bit too. You're coming in like you've had three instances now. You get your your first one, you're getting a second chance. Your second one, you're getting a third chance. And now Scruggs, who's well, this will be his third. I'll call this would be his fourth chance. Fourth chance. Now, I do think that. If Scruggs, and again, I don't know the severity, we don't know the number and all that, but let's say he he does have to move on. If he moved on and he was able to, if he needed treatment, get it, if he was able to keep his nose clean for, I don't know the period, six months, 12 months, I think getting another job, he might not be a defensive line coach. He might have to go, and, but I still think he could work in football. And you still, you don't know, just like want to throw guys out on the street, but you want to support them and everything else. but public jobs where you're in the public eye and you know, you're, you're at a university and the, the multiple time thing again is, uh, right. I don't know what, um, Moose is talking about. Michael says we need a point guard. Doug hit the portal. Uh, that is correct. Doug McDaniel is in the portal. So I can't tell a lie. George Washington, the third is as well. Look, uh, not a surprise. I'm not really surprised at anything when it comes down to the portal and basketball. Ferris wants the basketball program fixed. Somebody talking uh, wink. Moose doesn't follow basketball. Mm, Let's see if there's anybody else weighing in. Um, never too old to celebrate. I don't know. It's, um, that is in regarding most says, uh, Kenneth Grant, if I can get his up here is this guy, he's expecting a big year from him. Kenneth Grant is, you know, you, you look at Kenneth Grant and he's a, he's a man child. I say this because you, he looks like he's got like baby. He's an amazing player. He already is an amazing player. The way he moves. Who did he chase down? He chased down um, the running back from Penn State. And when I say chased him down, it wasn't like he was like five yards down the field. He just came down the line. He's like, oh wow. No, he he ran him. He was like forty yards down the field. And Kenneth Grant at three forty or whatever he weighs caught him. This guy, he could be the best defensive tackle in the country. Now, Mason Graham currently is the best defensive tackle in the country, but there he is. Shadyville is saying what I guessed that um, Benny was hurt in the Rose Bowl. Douglas now saying, and here's two people mentioning it, the Rose Bowl. Third people, Rose Bowl. So I was um, I was right in my guess. Let's see. Moose says he got his JJ Rose Bowl patch with the M Block Roses shoulders Jumpman jersey finally, and I love it. Yeah, that is nice. I got to tell you, Moose. I mean, I got a Coke can and a few shirts, you know, some things like that. A long time ago, this young lady took me to her house. And I'll spare you all the details, but she, the thing was downstairs. She's my, my, uh, her grandfather had a Michigan man cave. That's what it was. And this man cave was as awesome. I mean, I was walking down and there's probably a lot of great ones. I've seen, I've seen tons of great things from Michigan people. I've seen RVs inside of some RVs, entire houses. I mean, it is incredible. But this guy's basement was the uh, second to none. And he had pictures and everything, but in the in the one spot, he just had a rack of jerseys hanging up. Now they had plastic over them. 
And it actually didn't let everything else. Like there's so many things that were great in there, but then the rack of jerseys kind of stood out where it was like, it didn't look great. Aesthetically, I guess is what then she took one of the, I was like, Oh, those, what are those? They're jerseys. And they were game worn jerseys. Took the plastic off one. Like here's Desmond. How uh, incredible. The game jerseys. People that have those. I can't imagine what that guy was, uh, was, uh, had to pay for those. It's a good story. If we ever get out, we're watching some games together. Ask me a little bit more about that story. I got, I got more. Uh, here's Roderick says, so the guy needs some help. Firing him won't get him the help he needs. Uh, well, not necessarily Roderick. I mean, I think this is the thing there. A lot of people I think miss. Well, just fire him and throw him out in the street means you don't care. No, that's not what it all means. You can remove somebody from their position, and then you can also help them. You can, if treatment is needed, whatever kind of support. There's all kinds of different support that you could give somebody. But in, um, it's not if you keep him, you're supporting him, and you're a great Michigan man, and oh, that's all. And, and if you move on from him. Uh, you're just tossing him, away, discarding him like a, an empty piece of trash. It's not how it, it is. A lot of people are saying that. You can help somebody. Uh, people understand that this is a job. This is, this is not like your and my job. This guy is in the public eye. He is in this a position of high visibility with the football program. With rank comes responsibility. I don't like to, to say that either, and, and I'm not being harsh on him. I would love to give all anything that can you can assist. And since we don't know all the details, we just talk in general terms. But anything that you can do to uh, to help this man get the help he needs, uh, I would be for that. Well, let's let's. I, I think that people are confusing things. Conflating things, confusing things, making bad comparisons. I'm not saying you're making a bad comparison, but saying that this guy needs some help, firing him won't get him. It, it very well can. It could, and it, it could be one of the wake up calls at the other places. He was allowed to continue on as a player. Well, now he was kicked out of school, you know. So, you know, you have ramifications when you do do something. Believe me, I don't think he was sitting in the back of that cruiser with the lights flashing around thinking, oh, I'm good. Moose says Michigan doesn't need any more eyes on them, so I expect Scrubs to be fired. Uh, at, you said Scrubs, not that way. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it has anything to do with trying to keep – eyes away from Ann Arbor. Now, it being Sharon Moore's first really uh, fork in the road and that, you know, you think that he might want to establish something. I think there could be something to that. I do think that the guy's uh, has been hired only for, you know, 10 days. Also, like, so, uh, you know, I think that could put everything plays into everything, but um, I don't know about needing any more eyes on them. So I'm not sure that's what it is uh, down. Uh, Moose is looking for a 2024 natty patch. And tell me how you, why don't you send me uh, the details of that, uh, a Moose? I do have, what do I have? I have one of these. I haven't figured out what I'm going to do with it yet. It's a sticker. I, I taped it on. I, I like taping it on my shirts just for this show. I, it sounds stupid because it is, but I had a, a black hoodie on and I, I taped it on there and I'm like, wow, it looks really good. So it'll go somewhere. I just haven't figured it out yet where I was going to go. Shadyville thinks it's uh, simple. It is something that's black and white. He's talking about Scruggs. Richard doesn't want to be too hard on the guy, but it's a choice he made with a lot of eyes on him. Moose is saying, you're telling me Scruggs doesn't know about Uber. Come on. That's a dumb decision by him. 
Yeah, there's a lot of people, and it's, it, there's a point to it. Uh, you can just pick up a phone. You used to you have to wait for a kid, but you can get Ubers and Lyfts and everything. And when people that you know, here's the thing about it's, it. Just goes to show you if there's a if there is a cautionary tale about drinking is that people don't make good decisions when they drink. I don't know. Uh, if he, how frequent of a drinker, if this was just a bad situation, I don't know how much he had to drink, but people don't think rationally when they drink. I could report myself. It's been, I don't know, it was, it's been a couple of weeks. I think I was, I've been waiting for Thursday, the afternoon session. You know, I was going to have a few beers and watch the uh, NCAA tournament. But Going into uh, Thursday, I will, uh, this week, I will do really well with my diet and, and exercise and everything else. Just after a couple beers on Thursday, my um, my diet will be heading out the window. I know I say this, you know, it's like, it's, 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 uh, proclaiming it, so I know it's going to happen. But I, I speak from experience. It's very hard for me. It, rational thought, everything that you can think, it, it goes out the window. That's the way to see it. SW Lion says, not a good start to do this right after switching over. It's not a good look. Well, right. I mean, look, but it's it it happens. You have to deal with things. Things are going to come up all the time. You know, sure, it's not a good look, but you can move on. and um, And there you go. It's not that Michigan needs a clean program now. Michigan always needs a clean program. You know, the the hypothetical, if we are going to get to one, which would be interesting, and I think people, and, and this shows you how different things could be. I mentioned that Harbaugh had a, a, a prior DUI. Let's just say that Harbaugh got another one. Now, eh, history, you should be out. Now, if it was, you know, 2020, I think everybody would be like, yeah, it would have been an easy decision. But it, let's just say it was now that he stayed around. People would be like, let's give him a, you know, a chance, and then all of that. But this is where, this is how the, this is how the world works when you are, it was like, um, and it's different because we're talking about an alcohol situation, you know, like a player, but uh, it was like Kelvin Johnson when he was with the Lions. He got a lot more latitude to do things than other guys. And that would this be this kind of situation. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a hypothetical, but it, it's one of those that, yeah, your, your status can affect things with uh, how the people believe and how, you know, you ultimately get judged. That does happen. So there you go. Moose is going back to the pleading down case. Yeah, I didn't know what that was doing, but the court record said it was a, uh, a situation that was uh, alleged to be a DUI. So I don't know. Uh, you watch so much. Again, I was thinking black and white, but you, you you watch so much or you go online so much and there's so many people that are like, oh, I got trapped. Or uh, I, they, I always see these lawyers that are on there like, never tell them anything. And I'm thinking, well, if you, if I just, if I get pulled over and I have, have nothing to drink and uh, the cop is even like, hey, are you ready to submit to a breathalyzer where you come out here and you, you know, jump through a bunch of hoops and everything? I'd be like, sure. Let's do it, you know, and uh, I would do that. No, and if I had, I don't know, a few drinks and I'm, as a pull number, like, mm, wow, I've had three, that could be right. Up. Maybe I would be like, uh, I refuse or something like that. That's my thought about that whole thing, but I don't have any experience in it. I see everybody online saying this is what to do, not to do and everything else, but I, I would think cooperation would be in order unless you know you're you're thinking that you could be in trouble. Shadyville's got a zero zero tolerance. 
Ferris is saying is what he did worse than what Partridge did. Well, we don't know exactly what Partridge did to end up getting fired, but when you start comparing So again, we don't know exactly what Partridge did. Did, did he tell players to not give uh, did he coach players on what to say to the uh, was it the, the NCAA, you know? The first story that came out was like he destroyed some files or scrubbed some files and coached the players. I mean, so I don't know exactly what he did. But that's apples and oranges. Could probably come up with a lot of things where people get fired and you know that where you're at. Richard thinks that Howard needs uh, anger management. I don't think that could hurt for him. Papa says, what about heading down and uh, grabbing Larry Johnson from OSU for the next D-line? Well, hey, it worked with the it worked with the running back coach. Sure. Why not? What's up, Mike? Good to see you on here. Ferris is comparing John Beeline to our presidential candidates. <laughs> Not a bad. <laughs> it's, it's true. Uh, there we go. Oh, let's see. Ferris is uh, we're, now we're getting to the point where people are going to throw some names. Uh, Brian Dutcher took uh, San Diego State to the final game. He is a guy who ordered the baggy shorts for the Fab Five, a trend that continues today, 30 years later. Yeah, well, I think, unfortunately, Ferris, that Brian Dutcher's relationship with the Fab Five and his time as being Steve Fisher's right-hand man is also the reason that he is not going to be considered at all. Uh, but Dutcher knew everything that was going on with Ed Martin and, like Steve Fisher, decided to ignore it. And so you're not bringing – Brian Dutcher has zero chance of being hired at Michigan. Now, you could say that shouldn't matter. Uh, what Ed Martin was trying to do was you know, give money and, and uh, launder it with NBA players that were from Detroit. And it just so – well, I get all of but I can just tell you that there's going to be zero chance that Brian Dutcher is going to be even considered for the job at Michigan. But, you know, having said that, there was somebody on the staff this year that also uh, was involved in that. And, 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 you know, he ended up, but being an assistant, being a head coach is a little bit different. Sam says, why would Smart come to Michigan? Well, you know, I know back in the day when Al McGuire, you know, was at Marquette and Marquette was, uh, you know, considered to be a pretty good uh, basketball school and the Big East is a, a basketball conference. So I get all of that. But Michigan in the Big Ten is a step up from Marquette. That's why a Shaka Smart would do it. That's why he would consider it. SW Alliance says, do we really want to hire somebody who just signed on recently with another team? If they're that quick to leave on a new contract, they could do it again. Well, sure. That's right. That's part of it. That is what's going on. Jay Wright has said emphatically 100% that he is done with the college game. It is a kind of common knowledge that if he was ever going to come back, maybe he was thinking about it from an NBA standpoint. I think there's a 0% chance for Jay Wright. Now, I do think that Ward Manuel should have called him up and said, look, uh, Jay, we will make you the highest paid coach in all of college basketball. And your thoughts. I, like, I, I would hope that he would have made that call. Jay, we will get make you the highest paid coach. You can do whatever you want. You come on in. You're at the very top of our list. But you know, what about him? The call should be made and you get turned down. There's a lot of coaches that are like that, that you call and get turned down. You know, Billy Donovan's right on the bubble in the NBA with the Bulls, and he's got a pretty big contract, but the Bulls could be ready to fire him. Would I reach out to Billy Donovan's agent and say, hey, what if you get fired? I mean, what are you thinking about? Are you going to get fired? Your thoughts there? And, um, you know, 
Could they fire him sooner rather than later? Kind of the same thing. Farah says, I'm glad we did not have another interim becomes coach plan that OSU had. Do a full search. Mm, I don't know. OSU had a good month of, um, and I don't know if they're 100%. I know there have been some reports, but I've seen some reports the other way that, you know, hang on a second. But yeah, uh, I'm like the uh, full search idea that you're doing. CRW is saying that Louisville has four million in NIL for players. So, you know, yeah, Drake, Dusty May. Yeah, four million uh four forty thousand, you know, so not gonna happen with a Dutcher. See that name. McDermott just signed as well. McDermott, Lamont, Paris. Those guys just signed new deals. I mean, like within the last week. Brand new deals. Otis says, what about Rick Patino? I'd like to see him stress out Michigan's administration and admissions. When was, uh, before they got John Beeline, I went to, it's about to be 2006 or 2007. I actually went to, they had a, you call it a pep rally to get Patino out of, Whoever put it together it was like at the Diag. I was, I went out there and I'm just with a microphone. People were like Rick Patino. So yeah, you know, 15 years ago, people wanted Rick Patino. I'm not really sure that no, I, it's not happening anymore with Rick Patino in Michigan. He's another one that there's just zero percent chance. A big name, but a zero percent chance of getting Rick Patino. And I wouldn't like the other guys. Like I would call Jay Wright. I wouldn't call. Rick Patino, great coach, but just not a good fit for Michigan. Again, people don't make good um, decisions when they're drinking, so that's not an excuse. You know, that's not a good excuse. Well, I was drinking, so I made a bad decision. Well, okay, all right, that's maybe I shouldn't have said that at all. I probably shouldn't. Couple more um, the feedback if we have anything else going in. Uh, David Jelinek is talking about Connie Ruth's recommits. Uh, Connie Ruth is a, a close to a top 30 commit um, playing down at IMG. So that's good that he's staying with Michigan, if that is true. Otis clearing up that both DUI and OWI are acronyms for drunk driving offenses. I think that's true. Brian says maybe keep Scruggs on as an analyst that reduced pay, but he can't be sent on the road to recruit. Yeah. I, you know, that's another thing. Like I, I, I don't know. I'm not saying that it couldn't happen. That sounds like a good idea to me actually, but is that even an HR thing? So yeah, you're, we're removing you because you're in a public situation. You're going on the road to recruit, but we, we want to support you. You can stay around here. If you need treatment, we're there. Uh, you're still with the football program. We have your back, but you're going to be an analyst. I don't know. That sounds like a, a that sounds good to me, Brian, but I'm not 100% sure that that can happen. We want a 50 and forecast on the new basketball coach. All right, I'll give you that, Scott. I will give you a forecast. And let's see. Roderick says, I wonder, has everyone here made multiple state mistakes and was given grace? Yeah, here's the thing, like comparing, and I get that. We all personalize it, and here's what happens at my job. What you and I do, it's different than athletes and coaches. It is. I don't know if the point you're making is that he should be or shouldn't, but comparing, sometimes making those comparisons, uh, the one thing about it is a, a lot of us have had to make our, well, all of us have had to make decisions about whether you're going to be a drinker or you're not going to be and why and why you haven't and why you stopped and why you didn't, and why you would get in the car, why you wouldn't. So we all do have uh, experience when it comes down to that way, um, when it comes down to it. So I think that we're here. Ferris is saying that the Ed Martin thing was so overrated. 
didn't he do the same thing with the uh, MSU title winning team? Uh, he might have did some things with Cleves. You know, Michigan got hit with uh, de facto probation with uh, Ed Martin because of their proximity towards Detroit. That's what happened. Uh, the long and short of things, but uh, it was also it was a a forerunner to players being able to go from right to high school to pros like Garnett. The Chris Weber people were jamming thousands of dollars in the guy's pocket, you know, as he's walking on, on the street. It's uh, Kevin Garnett and, and Kobe after him, those guys. And, you know, now they have that one year thing, but, you know, there it is. Marcus is talking about Dusty May or Patrick Beeline. Scott wanted to know how uh, Juwan handled his. Uh, firing. He hadn't seen him make any comments. Will Jace stay at Michigan? I would guess that Jace didn't. It's in the sports update that I put out 15 minutes before this show comes on. I also did address it earlier on the show, but yeah, uh, Juwan said thanked Michigan for the privilege of being able to coach the basketball program where he played. So he, he couldn't have, uh, he couldn't have uh, been any more gracious in his departure. And so that was a great uh, job. Um, two more. Andre says it doesn't matter who Michigan gets unless they fix NIL. The next coach will inherit a bare, dusty cu cupboard with a shaky image as of late. Well, here's the thing just like if you're deciding you're going to be a politician. One of the first things that you have to do is you have to reach out to your base and get on the phone and you need to start getting them. You need to get money for your campaign. That is part of it. Uh, whoever the new coach is, is going to have to work with the athletic director needs to get involved in that as well. I know you all know that, but uh, a teamwork synergy with the athletic director and the next basketball coach to raise money for name, image, and likeness is going to be really important. Now, when it comes down to the transfer issues, all of you that, you know, large a jur, all these things. Anybody can be a Michigan fan. I didn't go to Michigan, and yet I'm a fan of Michigan. But when it comes down to the academics, if you pull Michigan alums, by and large, Alums don't want to change the admissions with uh, transfer credits. They don't want that changed. It could drop the, uh, you know, Michigan in, in their ranking, you know, their degree. Well, you didn't, uh, I think they don't want to do it because it, it lessens how their degree looks. Ask, ask someone. And so when you, people are like yelling at Ward Manual, Ward Manual when he talks to and he reads the thousands of emails he gets when they're Michigan alums, he's like, Ward, we appreciate you not bending on the academic and you know, the same thing when it comes down to Santa Ono. Hey, everybody loves Santa and everything. Santa, are you ready to change the academic standards? No, no, he's not. He's not changing the admission. So yell at Ward and yell at Santa and yell at him. But I guess yell at, alums because Michigan alums by and large don't want to change the academic standards uh, at Michigan. They don't want to do it. If it was up to me, I would change my admissions for foreign students and transfers for football and basketball. I guess you'd have to do it for more sports for the, uh, for title nine and everything, but I would change it. And I, my argument would be at Michigan, you want a robust and diverse and great student body and great and great in sports, you need to be able to stay there with your peers. That would be my argument. And that would be my argument to alums, but I don't know the, uh, who are we talking about? Do you think Michigan does it just because they're like, we don't want players transferring in here. There's a reason. The regents get voted in. Their voters tell them 
start emailing your region. If you're so, you know, want uh, Michigan to be able to get people in and transfer credits. Tell them that you're going to vote for them. Run on a platform of letting people get into Michigan with um, let transfer credits like everybody else in the Big Ten. Run on that platform. Start emailing. That's what you can do. Or you can just say, uh, Ward Manuel's a jerk. You know, that works too. I mean, you're not getting far maybe either doing either one of them. So I think that's it. Jay Wright and then Shaka Smart. There we go. I said I got one more. Being good in sports boosts the academic profile. Yeah. Well, Shady, I don't know if you can do this, but let's say Michigan decided that oh, their their academic transfer standards for foreigners and foreign students and for uh, other schools that they were going to I see dumb down. I was thinking of it. They they were going to uh, allow a lot more transfer credits. Then next year, when that um, when they rank uh, the public universities, Michigan's usually in the top five. I don't ever remember them being outside of the top five. It's usually USC, UCLA, Michigan, like in some order. Sometimes Michigan's number one. They Michigan Michigan changes it. I'd love to see what USC's and UCLA's academic uh, transfer stand. Can, can you just? I bet it's close to Michigan's. If it's not, then we were onto something here. But when they when they go to the U.S. report top public colleges next year, and Michigan changes their academic standards, and it's USC, UCLA, and then it's all these other schools, and then Michigan's like 15. They like drop 10, 15 spots. Everybody's going to be up in arms. My degree's worthless. People like the degree because they just go like this. They go for a job, and it says Michigan. They're like, you're hired. In one of the top universities uh, in the country. It drops down. Like, so I don't know. You might be right. It certainly does uh, help your academic profile when you're good in sports, but that's where I'm at. I'd have to make my 50 and forecast when it comes down to the coach. I think Michigan's next coach will be. Anthony Grant from Dayton. That's my pick today. Anthony Grant from Dayton. Grant to the Wolverines. Dayton is in the uh in the tourney. Wednesday I'll give you all of I, I've got so many I got Carolina winning it all. I've got two ones, Yukon, Carolina, and then I got two threes. Kentucky's on the other side and Creighton. I've got North Carolina against Kentucky in the championship game. And I've got North Carolina winning it all. Wednesday, I'll give you all those different upsets. And there you go. That's the forecast. Anthony Grant from Dayton, I think, will be the next Michigan basketball coach. So long, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you over on the Maize and Blue Review on the dead.